opportunity to talk about a subject matter very, very close to my heart, and that's cancer rehabilitation. I should probably just say I'm not at Bart's anymore, just in case I get into trouble. Um, can I just tell you just a little bit about our team? Because there may be a lot of people in the room who haven't heard of the Transforming Cancer Services team. We're actually part of the Healthy London Partnership. So I'm not in a, an academic institution, I'm not in a clinical environment. This is actually a strategic role, and having worked across different roles over my years, it's absolutely um, clear to me that this is the most challenging role that I've ever had, because my, my job, really, is to try and improve commissioning for cancer. And there's lots of complexity in that. I'm sure you understand cancer is over 200 different diseases. So I'm coming at this from a slightly different lens. And I'm not going to give you an overview of the literature. What I'm going to talk to you about is the work that we've been doing to try and reduce variation and ultimately try and improve some of the outcomes that we have for cancer rehabilitation across the capital. So these are just some of the headline statistics. I think some of these are particularly sobering. Um, Macmillan has done an awful lot of work in this area and we estimate that by the year 2030 there will probably be 4 million people who are living with and beyond cancer um, in the UK. So one in two people will get cancer at some point in their lifetime. Half of those people, however, will survive the disease for 10 years or more. So the 10, 5-year and 1-year survival rates are improving for lots of cancers. For some that are right down the bottom of the survival curve, they haven't changed much in a couple of years, so there's still a lot of work to do. We know that 70% of people who have cancer have at least one other long-term condition that they're living with. And 25% of individuals, and this is just results from one study, have unmet physical and psychological needs at the end of treatment. So actually, as we get better at keeping these people alive with a cancer diagnosis, ultimately that's going to mean that there's going to be an increased burden, isn't there, in terms of the survivorship issues. And that's where rehabilitation and recovery becomes particularly important. So... There are significant levers and drivers out there for us to pin, if you like, a lot of this work on. And they've been developing over many years. And I've just put a couple of those up for you, um, just to kind of give you a bit of a flavour. So up in the top left hand, we have the NHS um, five-year forward view. Um, across from that, the National Cancer Patient Experience Survey, which we look at um, rigorously every year. And that gives us lots of indications about how people are rating their treatment and where we need to improve. Just to flag up some of the rehabilitation-related work, so down in the bottom left there you'll see the NHS England's Commissioning Guidance for Rehabilitation. It's been out for a couple of years now. It's a very high-level document. It didn't really have an implementation plan associated with it as such, but having said that, down in the bottom right, the AHP's Into Action document, really important. If you are an AHP and if you are and you haven't read it, please do. Lots of good stuff in there about how we really drive forward the Allied Health um, agenda. In the middle at the bottom, this is a report. I spent a bit of time at NHS England as a regional lead for rehab in London, and I was asked to really develop a helicopter view of some of the challenges for rehab in London and how those could be, if you like, combated. And I'm pleased to say that some of the speakers um, that, that, that were on the programme today, we've actually highlighted in that report as examples of good practice. So the UK Rock programme, Darren's Cobbler Rehab class, I visited there and was really impressed, so we gave it a big shout in that report as well. So it was really, I think, some interesting findings from that report that, that might be applicable for some of other disease um, types that we've talked about today. And of course, not forgetting the NHS long-term plan. So some of you might have known or have put submissions into that long-term plan. And my understanding is that that's due to be published um, end of November into, um, into December. So please keep an, an eye out for that. So. I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but just, just a few kind of headlines. We know that rehab is an essential component of the high quality cancer care. It starts at diagnosis and it flows all the way across. We know it spans the entire ca cancer pathway. We know it brings a focus to adding life to years. And we know it's everyone's business with the HPs there as a specialist workforce. And yet, we do not yet have a parity of esteem in rehabilitation with the diagnosis and treatment parts of the pathway. And um, myself and a colleague, June Davis, um, produced an editorial for the European Journal of Cancer Care. I was very lucky to be associate editor there for a couple of years. And this was my swan song, really. I was asked to put an editorial out, and this is what we wanted to talk about. And really showing that because of the focus on cancer weights and on the early parts of the pathway, which are understandable, rehabilitation hasn't yet been given parity of esteem. So I, th um, some, I, I think some interesting um, findings um, from, from that editorial as well. 
So I want to talk you to, through two separate projects that we've done to try and reduce variation, just to help you understand some of the kind of approaches that we've taken. And the first piece of work that we did was looking at one of the um, significant consequences for a lot of cancer patients, which is lymphedema. Now, we know that lymphedema was prioritised in the five-year commissioning strategy for London. It had actually been in commissioning intentions for several years, and yet we knew there was huge variation in the provision of services. England has no national strategy for lymphedema, unlike Wales and Northern Ireland, where they're really driving the way. And we know that the economic impact of not delivering good lymphedema care is significant. And one of the, um, the quotes that I use a lot is that bottom one by Macmillan, um, where we've estimated that for every pound that we spend on specialist lymphedema services, we'll save the NHS £100 in reduced hospital admissions. So we set about trying to develop some guidance that we would put into the wider system to try and help commissioners in their commissioning of these lymphedema services. Now, from, the, from our name, the Transforming Cancer Services team, we were very aware that we didn't want to reduce, um, or uh, sorry, to increase the gap between cancer-specific services and non-cancer-specific services. So when we designed this, it was in, um, we really did it with the view that all patients with lymphedema would benefit from this work, and also that it wasn't just something for London. We hoped that this would be scalable and would be picked up outside London. We brought together an expert task and finish group with, from all over the country to really give us good clinical advice on what good looks like. And one of the important things was we didn't want to produce guidance that commissioners wouldn't use. So we did some qualitative work with seven London CCGs. I interviewed seven GP commissioners to say, look, tell me about how you're currently doing this. What would be important? What would you like to see in guidance that would, in, that would really enable you to use it? The other thing that we knew was important was we would have to map services because you can't really show gaps unless you know, you know where your services are. So we did a very detailed mapping of services in London. And we've produced two <laughs> documents that are out there in the public domain and I'll give you the link at the end to these documents. One was the commissioning guidance that we produced in 2016 and then the follow-up was a template business case. And the reason that we did that is we didn't want any excuses. We didn't want commissioners to say, okay, we're not quite sure now how to get the data. So we actually produced a template <coughs> business case for them and they just needed to put their local data in. Um, and that would help um, give them, if you like, um, the information that they needed. So it all sounds very simple, doesn't it? And straightforward. Well, this is a service map. I'm sorry this doesn't come out particularly clearly, but each little number here represents where we have a service in London. And hopefully you can see that big red patch is Barking, Havering and Redbridge in North East London. And there were no services there whatsoever, nothing. And one of the things that we did is we knew from some international consensus um, work that a lymphedema specialist practitioner should probably have about 200 to 210 patients in their caseload. We were able to use good prevalence data to calculate how many patients we would have probably in each CCG and then we mapped that up to STP level and that was then how we were then able to do our workforce calculations and we prioritised those sustainability and transformation plan, um, plan areas that had the poorest um, provision and that's how we then kind of prioritised where we were going to give most of our attention. So what did we learn from this project? Well, we learned that the guidance was well received, it was highly valued, and we had areas out with London that were interested in this work. We found that the mapping <coughs> exercise was really powerful because it could really then sh you know, shine a light, if you like, on the areas where we needed to improve. The economic message was probably the most important one, and that's what the commissioners were really interested in. The workforce were terribly engaged, and particularly the specialist workforce, many of whom were working single-handedly um, in community services, really keen to, you know, to come to us and say, look, how can we help drive this agenda forward? How can we help get the message across that lymphedema care is important? We were commended um, this year in the Healthcare Transformation Awards. Um, for our work in terms of its potential to reduce variation. But despite all of this, implementation work is challenging. And I'm sure any of you that have ever tried to do this sort of work will, will agree with me a few nods at the front. This is really difficult work. And um, again, after producing the business case, you know, we still had people coming to us and saying, look, it's difficult to get this data, Karen, because we're not always coding it correctly in A&E and in other places. So we're not there yet, but we're certainly, we're making headway. 
So I'm going to just touch now on the second piece of work, which is actually a bigger project, because this is really trying to produce commissioning guidance for cancer rehabilitation. And, and by that, again, we're covering all types of cancer in all settings. Um, and, uh, and some of this is commissioned um, differently. So um, a, a challenging thing to try and do. And the aim of the guidance really is to show what good looks like and to give recommendations for the wider system to support implementation. Now, to get to this point, we've had a steering committee that's been working, a chair of that committee has been working with me for over a year now, and we've got three task and finish groups looking at three different work streams. Number one is the mapping of services and how they're commissioned, and I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to focus on the second and the third, which is the development of a service improvement tool and the development of a minimum data set. Now, we hope that this work will finish um, at the end of March, um, which is when my contract finishes, so it's a very hard deadline. Um, and we hope it will be an interactive PDF, so there'll be lots of links to other documents in there, because we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not trying to you know, reproduce what NHS England did in their commissioning guidance. We're trying to just, I suppose, put a little bit of meat on the bones for cancer and give a few more indications about what good looks like. So, really interested to hear the presentations this morning, and particularly from Professor Turner Stokes around the UK rock work. We're very far behind. Um, what we're trying to do at the moment is just answer very, very basic questions that we can't really, we don't know the answer to at a London level at the moment. So it's just stuff like, you know, who's actually <coughs> getting cancer rehab? Where are they getting it? What are they getting it for? What are the consequences of treatment they're being treated for? Is it pain? Is it fatigue? Is it lymphedema? Um, in which setting are they getting seen, which therapists are seeing them, what's the outcome, and it's that minimum level data that we can't really look at at the moment at a London level. So we're not looking at proms at all, we're not there yet, that's the next stage. We produced a report, so I'm very lucky um, from where in my, in my workplace that I've got access to a team of analysts who work for Public Health England, and so we've been working really closely with these analysts. First of all, to look at what data is currently being captured, and now we're, we're looking at how we can then implement our data set that we've produced. We're working very closely with NHS England, with the Chief Allied Health Professions Officers team, with the cancer team, and also with Macmillan Cancer Support, because one of the things that I didn't see is that Macmillan um, really a couple of years ago, put a really important um, piece of work called the recovery package, and they promoted that really heavily, and that is actually now something that has been implemented at scale across the UK, and that recovery package, and um, there's an EHNA's part of that, which is a holistic needs assessment, and there's a portal, an online portal. So we've been looking at how we can embed some of the work that we've come up with in terms of this data set into the Macmillan portal. Um, but I can't give any guarantees that that's the way that we will proceed. We're still in ongoing talks about how we pilot our data set at scale. Um, we have produced a report that tells you a little bit about the metrics and how we've come to those decisions on, on what we want to capture. There's 32 data items in there, but only 16 of them are unique. Um, about half of them are actually already collected, but in, in, but in a different way. Um, by different systems, and so these are the categories that, that, that we're looking at and that we want to pilot now. The service um, improvement tool um, has taken probably about six months um, to get to this point. Georgina Wiley was um, our project facilitator who worked with us very closely and led this work. And what they've come up with, I think, is a really lovely tool that in the pilots across London can be filled out in about 30 minutes by a therapies team. There's lots of different values, and I've just given you a little bit of an indication there, a flavour of what one of the values is that we're looking at here. It ensures exemplary patient experience. And teams will actually, they will score themselves. And then the idea is that they come up with some ideas for service improvement based on how they score themselves. But there's a separate tool that service users will use as well. And the idea is to put the two of them together to get a complete picture of your service. And then hopefully every six months or 12 months, that will then be reviewed. And the plan for this is that we'll launch a report and also the tool itself. It will hopefully go onto the Macmillan online portal along with the other cancer rehab resources at the end of this month, maybe into December. So again, really, really keen for people to get involved in this and I'll say a little bit more about that just right at the end. We had a wonderful artist who worked with us on all of the stakeholder engagement work and they've given us this lovely mural um, which I think is really quite powerful in terms of some of the messages around rehab. 
And we've also put some videos out on YouTube. And these have been, I can't tell you how helpful these have been, because this is patients mm -hmm. talking to camera saying, what's been valuable to me about rehabilitation, why it, it matters to me that I had rehab, you know, what would have happened if I didn't get it. But also patients who perhaps hadn't had as good an experience with rehabilitation, talking about some of the consequences of treatment that they really struggled with. So if you're interested, we can send you the links for these. And this is all going to be part, if you like, of the compelling narrative that we use to, 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 to persuade commissioners that we need to be looking at this um, and really improving what we're delivering across London. So next steps, just in the last couple of seconds, we're always keen for comments on the work that we've done. So please, I'm giving you um, my email address in a minute. If there's anything that you'd like to comment on, if you want to see the tools, if you want to be involved in any of the evaluation work, please let us know. And then also just what to look out for. So hopefully into next year, we will have the first meeting of a lymphedema community of practice. This is a pan London bringing together of lymphedema practitioners. Um, we hope to start piloting our benchmarking tool, as I said at the end of the year, so if anyone has colleagues or yourself, if you're working in the field of cancer rehab, please let us know and we'll um, give you the information. We're looking to pilot this data set at scale and um, the details of that are still pending, so please watch this space. And we will have a launch event at some point in the spring where we launch the guidance, hopefully with a bit of fanfare and, and, and get a lot of people um, in the room. So thank you very much for your attention. This is my email address if you want to get in touch and all of our resources are available on the Healthy London Partnership website. So thank you for your time.